Welcome to the Jazz Cabbage Cafe. There it is. This is our perpetual uh, official first show. <laughs> perpetual. Until, until we actually get some shit down and uh, and uh, get this together a little bit better, we'll, we'll just continuously be, be excellent practice. Yep, preseason. But it's all good. We have a lot of content from the last few shows, and people have gone and listened to some of it, so that's been cool, and that's been the point. We've had some good people on already. And uh, aside from Rick Thompson, who's our regular, our co-host, our, our anchor, not good people. Not very good people, but all those other things. Yeah. And Derek Gauchi. Yes. Some tape. And joining us today is the wonderful Deborah Young. Hey, everybody. And, uh, Hello, she, Deborah. She's quite often on Planet Green Trees, which is a, another great medical marijuana-based radio, internet radio program with host Michael Camorin, where many of us have also spent a lot of time and had some good times. But we are here now and we're going to talk about a lot of good stuff and uh start having right at it Mark will be doing the news later on which is a fan Absolutely. favorite we'll be talking about some events that are taking place ways people can participate and take action in activism and advocacy and help to affect change with us a little bit about what's going on uh, with with marijuana and in the news there's the uh, michigan state police head who passed on her on her uh uh, Facebook page perpetuated a post about people kneeling at the at the NFL games as being degenerates and some other kind of abusive terms or something like that. And now she is very heavily uh, being scrutinized for that. And a lot of our people have been kind of weighing in. Oh, but she's going to be so heavily rewarded. Did you also notice that she'll collect her full salary plus a pension? Big double dipping going on. And, and, and that's yeah. common, but she got looked at Men because of this uh, exposure. I mean, mm-hmm. she could have probably made it go away sooner or maybe had better judgment at the time. Uh, I think people are mislabeling what she actually did, but did what she actually did strong enough to give her this ty- type of criticism? I think it is personally, but some people are portraying it as, as a lot more directly uh, sinister, I think, than how it went down. I think it's absolutely true that when you're a public figure, especially when you're a person at that level, you have to appreciate that all of your actions and all your words and all of your public profiles are going to be scrutinized. And if Donald Trump hasn't taught us anything, it's that, wow, people pay attention to Twitter, people pay attention to Facebook, especially journalists nowadays. So when you're so callous and casual in the way that you respond, it kind of means you're casual about some of the other job duties you have don't true, you think true but even even beyond that is she broke her own work rules yeah. so even if you're working for a conservative you know uh, establishment kind of, of situation in Lansing a Republican situation that might agree with her opinion they still have to take action because she broke you're not supposed to be commenting politically I we, we haven't heard yet whether or not she's going to get some type of uh Oh, I thought she was on suspension. Oh, did she? I didn't hear a reprim- about it. Some kind no. of reprimand, she, something I happened. think there was a decision that's going to be made on that, like an investigation uh, and a decision. I, see, I know I was she said she will not step down, but that's famous last word. No, she's not going to step down, but she could get like a like a couple-day suspension or a demerit or just whatever their normal oh policy last, like, consequences. Last, last I heard, Governor Snyder wasn't going to do anything about it, that he was not going to issue her any kind of a sanction, Good, and, that that was, and that she was, and that he was re-upping her contract to do this whole thing. That's all true, but that's just a little bit different. Like he said, he's not going to ask her to step down over this stuff but the department has its own set of rules and guidelines and there's an investigation as to whether or not she violated that and if she did she's she's subject (laughs) to some kind of penalty which would be like Mm. maybe a couple day suspension or whatever they do i don't it's nothing like she can't get but the public is watching rick so you can say internal affairs but the public is watching that's true too she's done a lot of apologizing Mm -hmm. uh for whatever that's worth and uh and has had to face lots of angry groups. Most recently, the uh, black cur- clergy have been calling for her job. She did go have a discussion with the uh, black caucus in the legislature. Mm-hmm. She's trying to do what she can do. Uh, she's a public figure, though, and she made that mistake, and, and uh, it's kind of hard to shake it at this point. But the other thing that, that bothers me is that here's a person who's clearly at a juncture in their career where they could be asked to just retire under regular purposes. Thank you very much for your service. You've been a great warrior. We appreciate it, you know. But instead of that, we've decided to extend this person for an additional employment period here for the state at, at great expense, as we've already talked about. Uh, why? why? Why would we do that? Is there, are there simply no other people in the state police competent enough to take her position? I can't Apparently believe not. that. I just can't buy it. Is it Rick 
Snyder just trying to hold Stand on to the man. establishment for even what consider this if you're imagining that in 2018 it's possible that a Democrat might become governor you'd want to make sure that as many of your Republican friends stayed in positions of power after the election as possible so you'd extend the contract of someone who runs the state police you'd extend the contract of someone who who is you know at the Department of Transportation Bodry possibly but you could put anybody in there you could put any one of your political puppets in there many 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 people myself yeah. included believe that Rick Schneider holds a lot more responsibility in, in, with the issues in Flint uh, than maybe uh, he is being treated as at the moment. Mm-hmm. And so at one point he could have decided to step down, and there's enough there that that would have been reasonable. I mean, again, my, my opinion on that. Some people believe that he has nothing to do with it all, and how they get there I'm not sure, but uh, he can't like reasonably ask somebody else to step down over something like like passing on a stupid meme in Facebook even though you know it has big implications because of her position and stuff right but i mean man he was he's he has a huge responsibility in what happened in Flint which is a lot more major of a deal than this thing is i'll say this too when you when you step down from a position you sort of put a black mark on a permanent basis to the remainder of your political career. And if you're someone like Colonel Latoui, who very legitimately could could want to go into state office or even local office, too, and she's probably very, very good at it. Young, you know, so she, she seems intelligent other than this, this meme situation. So, you know, you don't want to do that because you're sacrificing something further on down the road, regardless of the correctness or lack thereof of that of that action. And as far as I'm concerned, an apology without sincerity might as well just stay inside your throat, right? Don't even bother speaking it if you don't really believe it. Another subject we discussed right. earlier. Exactly. Yeah. Hey, I have your personal opinions, but if you happen to hold a particular position in which it's inappropriate to for people to think yep. you, keep it to you, yourself. you might be right. keep, it to yeah. yourself. keep it to yourself. Keep it to yourself. Or discuss it, you know, on, on a personal level with your friends, not yeah. in social media where everybody reads it. No, I agree. I agree. You know, like we said, uh, the lesson of Donald Trump is that there is no social media corner that you can scurry to that reporters can't find, that activists are not looking at. And when you're a public figure, you have a different level of scrutiny now. Uh, Everybody's got cell phones with cameras. So when you screw up at at somebody's birthday party and it happens to end up on YouTube, you know, because – Somebody doesn't like you and they were at that party and they saw you drunk and staggering. And so, you know, you got drunk and staggered at a party. So you're you're now kind of responsible for that behavior, even if it's off time. Right. So there's a lot of implications and, and a lot of lessons people should be learning from this. We are rapidly approaching 420. That's what I, I was going to say. We oh, have a, about a four-minute countdown. We'll, we'll be we'll – be coincidentally taking a break right around that time, I'm pretty sure. Oh, there's no coincidentally. That is a lesson learned. We missed yeah. we missed announcing 420 yeah. last week, and we will never, never. miss announce. That's why this is our we perpetual first it. show. We never actually never did that. <laughs> yeah. Hey, there we go. <laughs> so again, Do we, our first show. We welcome. Take a knee, we take a kneel at 420. Yep. We take a, we, we, we take a knee. Yep. We wrap yeah, ourselves in the flag. Knee. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. We we Rick jazz the cabbage. Right, this jazz is what we do. Again, Rick sings the national We got to get this name up. Jazz Cabbage Cafe, people. You're listening to the one and only. We are and, so uh, awesome. A little while after we come back in, and of course at any time, please feel free to call 313-879-5059 and weigh in on uh, any of the conversation that we're having or bring up a new topic for us, and we'll bat that around a little bit. But a little bit after 5, after Rick does the news, we're going to hear from attorney Paul Talinda from Gross Point, who's involved in a lot of things and has been around since the beginning of this medical marijuana uh, emerging scenario in 2008 with clients for... Uh, being patients and caregivers and in business yeah. and he's been a part of uh just so many different things he's got a lot to offer and he worked with the agro family throughout their whole ordeal and i want to talk to him a little bit about that that is something that is a pretty big deal in this community and hasn't been discussed as much as it really should be in my opinion so mm-hmm. i'm going to get some of the agro family in here over the next few weeks but we'll start off by talking to paul about that and some other things uh, a little bit later today that's absolutely true. So I think we're just about ready to do our break, or maybe we need to, to stretch a little oh, bit. Oh, yeah. No, I'm always ready for the 420 break. It's my favorite one. And so I'm always don't. stretching a little bit, so wow, we're covered no matter what. That's gross. Well, Good thing it's radio. Or, or rolling it in between my thumb and, and uh, index finger a little bit. Uh, well, when you hear Jimi Hendrix, Purple Haze, move to that the means side of the we table. Need prel. We need that it's time that you time. roll up. Uh, I, I was... All right. We're back. We're back. Hopefully you enjoyed. And by we're, I mean mainly 
me. Other people are still hanging around I'm outside here. I'm here. celebrating 420. And Deborah has joined us. Too. Living in a single room Where Jamie goes, I will follow. Some of us are more lushly than others. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so welcome back to the Jazz Cabbage Cafe. We're here. And uh, I enjoyed that discussion about the uh, Michigan State Police because uh, a lot of our community members found that to be an interesting story on social media. And some people have had actually had some uh, some issues with her and an expanded uh, story about this woman, uh, Melanie, who was involved in this very, very bizarre scenario down in Monroe. And her situation came to light because her husband is a police officer who was involved in a lot of illegal forfeiture um, issues. And he was uh, convicted and he had to, to serve a little bit of time. Now, they like for all the stuff he did, he hardly got a slap on the wrist. He was a, he was a state cop. His name was Luke Davis, and it's a, it was a big story a few years ago. And he yes, was a state cop. He was and a state cop, But, yeah. the, you know, state cops have been in the news so much lately with with this 15-year-old boy that was killed by the, the state cop who tasered him a couple of weeks ago. Tasered him with Tasered him, so kill, murdered yeah, a child but, uh, on an ATV on his own block, murdered a child in cold blood in front right. of his parents. I know. That's horrible. So, so Melanie weighed in to say... When people were saying, do we really know enough about this person to be criticizing her like this? I mean, yeah, is this the only do. thing we have? And she came in and said, yeah, she glossed over uh, the shit with, with my ex-husband and almost got me killed. So, yeah, I don't like her either. I don't like her yeah. either. Wow. Yep. A lot I'm, of, I'm not a fan of cops, though. So. No, well, uh, <laughs> what can I say? well, there are a lot of good ones, but it only takes a few in certain well, positions my, to, to yeah. cause a lot of problems. Yeah, I, I would agree. I think uh, people view police officers like they view lawyers you know oftentimes we've had an experience that's been really really good but one bad one will pretty much set you off Mm -hmm. Uh, you know one former police officer made a little bit of headway this this week Uh, senator jones introduced a bill which was awkward to hear from senator jones and he's going to help prevent police officers who have been terminated from their positions from jumping to other jobs and what he wants to do is have as part of their personnel record recorded all of the stuff that they do that's bad, whether they're found guilty or not. That, so, isn't that, that's, why isn't that already done? Well, we because <laughs> Michigan's a, a state that really loves our police officers, Obviously. so we shield and protect yeah, there's them. There's that dude from Angster who went that. back and forth in Detroit to, no. and, and got like sued and nailed like this, so many this times. This cop really. that killed this boy that I'm telling you about mm-hmm. had three or four previous incidences with tasers and, and undue force against citizens. Right, they, they're told they can do whatever they want. I swear. Yeah. Well, it must here's be you know, and oftentimes, no. yeah, oftentimes you'll hear uh, police officers or, or uh, uh, administrators blaming the police officers' union, saying that the union makes it difficult for us to discipline people. I don't buy that. No. If you know someone's done something heinous like that, you terminate them first. You and then you worry you, about the lawsuit second because public safety is your priority. Who's that guy from Oakland County, uh, Mark? Furman? Furman, yeah. And he's he would fit into this exact situation. No, in fact, Mark, he might Mark have been Furman was on the O.J. thing. O.J., that was O.J. No. He was the kind no, of... No, the name the is N-word. similar. The name is similar to that. Right. Okay, he was also in Randy's case uh, mm-hmm. uh, and did the same thing. He inspected potential evidence before there was any warrants or anything oh, like yeah, that. yeah, I know who you're talking about. Uh, and so he did get fired. They decided not to actually charge him. They were scared somehow he'd get in front of a jury and... Around there. They gave some really weak, stupid excuse. Mm-hmm. But that guy ended up going to work for that weird little township um, that... That allows for uh, uh, like Kid Rock and all these other people to become police officers there, so that they can carry, they can conceal weapons and bring them onto school property and other privileges that police have that others don't. And what Jamie's talking about is is a township literally that has, I think, what is it, a uh, hundred and fifty reserve police officers, even though the the town itself only has like three thousand people. I, yeah, I remember reading about. And those. it's because the sheriff either sells the ability to be on the reserve officers list because if you're a reserve officer, you get a badge. You get the ability to carry. You can probably handguns. park wherever you want to park. I want a badge. You know, all kinds stuff. of stuff. Yeah, yeah, well, give enough money to the sheriff. Apparently, he do it. So, oh, nice. uh, you know, it's been revealed that there was a, a Detroit piston that had one of the that had a, a reserve officer status there. People who obviously will never ever do anything, you know, regarding that that particular community. So when you let officers bounce from place to place like that. I have to say that I like I like this. I think it should have already been in place. Yeah. I, uh, uh, you know, and for once, perhaps uh, Rick Jones will actually utilize his experience as a police mm-hmm. officer in a way that I approve of. Not that he's done horrible things. I don't approve of a lot of the stuff he's done. But the fact is, with this, he's he's cleaning up his old job. He's helping police officer or police departments not get stuck 
with someone else's rejects. And frankly, there are some offenses that if you do them, you should never be allowed to be a police officer again. Well, he also um, is putting on a uh, or has sponsored a bill with Senator Netzel about keeping dispensaries open during the transition time. Uh, yeah, there's actually two bills in the Senate. He sponsored one, and the other one is sponsored by five ninety nine to six hundred. I think I don't know exactly what the right. they're described exactly. The headlines are described exactly the same on the Bolton. Yeah. So, see in the in the the bill that we're talking about would preserve and protect dispensaries and other medical marijuana related businesses during the transition time of the formation and creation of the MFF. We talked about it here, but in terms of uh, Representative uh, Robbie's Mm -hmm. bill in the House. This is the Senate version, and and one of the weird and or interesting things here is that Rick Jones is signed on to it. Now, when he does something, it's never just purely altruistic, or it has not been our experience in his political career that that's why he's motivated to do something. This is also kind of contradictory to his stance or previous like uh, opinions on some of these things rick jones actually said there should be no smokable marijuana marijuana should only be available as a uh, as pills or as as, as uh, some topicals there should be no smoking available That's so kind of he had the marijuana bars uh, uh bill from a few years ago well, i mean maybe, the guy's he's, been maybe weird. he's learning who I knows well, and it was he's <laughs> largely responsible <laughs> for the mmfla I'm, going I'm through stretching for something but, here, you know even yeah. though the mmfla exists you know i mean and we're going to utilize it to get started with. The, 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 it was a bastardization of, yeah. Yeah, of where, where it could have been. And so it's, it, it behooves you know some people and, and not others as, as we're experiencing. But why did he do this? Well, here's a, uh, something to think about. I was uh, perusing old articles in regards to the formation of the MMFLA, and I came across a Detroit Free Press article, which was a big expose about the politics behind the passage of HB 4209 and the creation of what became the MMFLA program. And what they said was, many of you recall, in 2015 and 2016, that legislation passed through the House and the Senate, passed through the House Judiciary Committee and the Senate Judiciary Committee. The House Judiciary chaired by Clint Kesto, the Senate chaired by Rick Jones. Shortly after the MFLA passed, the chief of staff of Clint Kesto's operation, his his, his, uh, uh, chief of staff, resigned in order to become the lobbyist for the Michigan Responsibility Council. And the chief of staff of Senator Jones's office resigned in order to become the leader of the Michigan Cannabis Development Association. Now, that is an association of existing dispensary owners, so that connection makes some sense. But what's the what, what's the benefit? Is it a favor? No, you, what, isn't it so r- ridiculously coincidental that the two committees, which experienced the most change to this bill from the 2014 version, right? I mean, I think we can easily argue that the largest changes to the to the 2014 version were made in the House Judiciary and made in the Senate Judiciary under the tutelage of these two gentlemen. So what kind of collusion is industry having with the legislative process? And then look at Sandra McCormick, who was Senator Jones's chief of staff, now head of the MCDA, and is she still talking to Senator Jones? Is there some kind of a connection with Senator Jones to her? Because they worked together for years. I don't think that there's any conflict with them. I think they still have a good rapport. No, that's my concern. Okay. Is I that, think that's that true. He's, he's, he's perhaps sponsoring this bill because he knows right. something or it creates an advantage. Well, we, don't have much, we, we don't have much except for these facts to discuss and how they relate to each other i mean we, we don't have like an actual story here or, you know to say he's doing this because of this but it is true that this close connection is part of a dispensary group and he's trying to keep dispensaries open so is you know is there a connection there there may be that's exactly what i just asked <laughs> right before the disclaimer but yeah i mean that's the, that's the whole point i though. just i wasn't listening to you and i just didn't think you'd have the forethought to do something that makes right, sense like right. that <laughs> no but it, when it comes down to it i think it's very legitimate in michigan politics nowadays to consider um follow the money kind of a trail um it, we've seen so many different issues uh receive preferential treatment by the legislature not the least of which was the pharmaceutical grade marijuana program senate bill 660 which flew through the legislature and was passed and signed by the governor. Yep. You know, during that discussion, Gretchen Whitmer was the uh, Senate minority leader, mm-hmm. and she actually tried to amend it and, and offer up uh, a few ideas to make it significantly more liberal and less restrictive than it is. I mean, she knew it wasn't going to fly, uh, obviously, but she wanted to make the point and get the discussion out there, as many of those pe- many people who have been in our support have. Jeff Irwin in the, in the House has introduced things just to get mm-hmm. the discussion going, knowing it's not really going to get anywhere. 
And uh, she put herself on record as being in support. And, and uh, just recently, I got to speak with her for a little while. Uh, she's agreed to come on this very show soon, too. So we'll we'll be setting that up and having her on here. But I was at the Cannabis Council for a fundraiser for her. She made it really clear that uh, she is in support. And as of right now, I'm most definitely gonna gonna put my time and energy behind her candidacy because we could really use that kind of leadership in Michigan. I am kind of a single issued minded person politically, but uh, I I like her approach and style and things she says on other issues as well. You know, we have a couple of really good candidates for attorney general and governor and Dana Nessel and and uh, Gretchen Whitmer. They're not the only candidates for those positions, and both of them are Democrats, which means they'll have primaries to go through. Well, they'll have to face off against other Democrats before they get to the, the yeah, big the, show. Yeah, the attorney general will be decided by the at a convention That's by right. the delegation, and right. then there will be a primary for the right. for the governor. You're right. So we still have a, a process to go before these people are actually named as a as the the candidate but man they they sure look good they're talking good and they have the bona fides they both are experienced professionals the ag scenario is a little uh, concerning to me uh, patrick miles is not uh that awesome on our issue he was on off the record not too long ago and said that he doesn't even believe in medical marijuana that's candidate for the attorney general from yeah. western michigan yep yeah, and this is why it uh, kind of concerns me it seems as though most he's of the, the republican can he's a republican he's a democrat oh he's a democrat he's a democrat and re- he's a republican in democrats clothing yeah it's, wow. it, most of the democrats though have kind of a, a lot of the higher powered ones have kind of checked him in he, he's mm-hmm. got a little level of of significant support when it comes to the delegation uh, i i well, the, the Democrats in the state have not been, our political, you know, uh, people have not been strongly well, in favor. Even pr- if they're privately, are publicly they are not, with the exception of this couple we've named, like Jeff mm-hmm. Irwin, uh, just a handful. Everybody else runs when you try and speak to them about this, even well, this now. Is, but the, he, he went, he didn't even say something like Shooty would say, like, oh, let the voters, he right. didn't even put it off. He actually said, he doesn't, I mean, and that's. And, and that means my state it, rep has said the same thing. That means and Sandy Levin has said the same thing. He does not even believe in medical. These are people that you, that you think are right on on every other topic, and they're right there on everything. And in this one, they've just got so wrong. Well, yeah. it means that he doesn't pay attention to to which topics are kind of important to people and voters. Well, he's consi- and, constituents, my uh, state rep, where we passed all the legalization in, in his entire district, every single city by. You know, 68% and above, some of them in the 70%, he still would vote against this stuff because he doesn't personally believe in it. So they're not representing the people. So there's a very good chance, though, he could make it in is yeah. the problem because he has a lot of support. Uh, Mark Totten, who was an excellent candidate for attorney general last time around running against Schutte, uh he ran pro-marijuana and he ran to, to fix the uh, uh, the oil line in the line five. Line five. Uh, other you know important things he basically said i'm going to do my job here and not just take it upon myself to use my opinion in these decisions as shooty like <laughs> commonly does right, right. take every uh, stupid I- idiot thing to the it, united states the supreme court it's it. possible that while patrick the miles has this as his personal opinion he might follow the law you know and implement it properly and not pull a shooty on us but it's really concerning that he doesn't recognize it as as an important issue as a political candidate and we and have he's to willing call to let that go publicly well uh, i mean he's not going to get my again. vote I, I, i'll just i'll just say this now there's a there's a Republican Republican candidate for attorney general who I don't prefer uh, particularly uh, when compared to the things that Dana Nessel has very specifically said about why she supports legalization. She hasn't just put it off or been neutral. She gets very deeply into why she supports it, and that's important to me. Uh, But Tom Leonard is is also running for AG as a Republican candidate, and uh, as of now, he seems like a fairly reasonable person and equally or, or better than Patrick Miles. And so I, I might look to him if if uh, Patrick Miles is the Democratic candidate. You know, it, when it comes to state government, uh, sometimes there's not a whole lot of difference between the Repubs and the Dems, uh, other than whether or not they can get things done. And one of the things we've seen with the Democrats is that they have all the willpower and all the fire and brimstone, but they just lack the numbers, the voting numbers to get anything accomplished. So it's... It's tragic when all these great ideas held by all these wonderful representatives just fall on the floor and, and get no attention. So if we had a Republican attorney general that could maybe uh, be a positive influence in some of the Republican-dominated legislative issues, 
that would be advantageous to us, especially if he if he was making opinions and rulings a la Bill Schuette in the first two years of his administration. But that made sense. Yeah. You know, I, know. I mean, he's not – of course, he's not going to be a home run for a lot of us in this community, but yeah. – uh, he has he has managed to carve himself out a pretty nice career and not be one of the big assholes that we discuss, mm-hmm. you know, in the legislature all the time. So, you know, if we're talking about uh, you know lesser of evils or however, you have to look at candidates sometimes. Uh, That's you know. every time. <laughs> well, I, I, you know, I think we might be lucky in Michigan here if we can get some uh, weight behind a couple of the candidates that are stepping up. We gotta, I find it to be kind of refreshing, especially after what we've had to experience the last few years here. The other thing is, you know, we've gone so long with really poor choices that we default to the political jokes of no no good candidates, you know. Uh, the best man running is the, you know, guy in the graveyard. Uh, i got to be honest with you, though. I'm, I'm excited about the opportunity to maybe cast my vote for somebody that does support my beliefs. It'd be kind of cool if there's, if there's this uh, trend to get behind these two strong women to come in and, and make, whoever the Secretary of State is running to, uh, I'm not sure who, that's, who the candidates are there. I, I really haven't paid that much attention to that. But uh, the idea of having like this combination uh, of, of Gretchen Whitmer and Dana Nessel to kind of just take a different approach. Uh, it would be very g- sweet direct, in the era yeah. of Trump. It would be very yeah. sweet. Maybe there's enough rebelliousness to try to get behind that. Well, with, without need, uh, I guess I should say more than rebellious. <laughs> we I don't, need I'll, to fix this bullshit. What we really need to do is pay some Russian to do some targeted <laughs> Facebook advertising, <laughs> and couple. we can swing the vote. <laughs> There's a couple on my block in Michigan. Oh my goodness! I'm yeah, sure so it doesn't matter how much uh, <laughs> how much support we get behind them; the actual votes have to come in correctly. Right. However, that works these days. Well, uh, you know, we 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 joke about things like you know uh, election fixing and Russian influence and things like that too, um, but you know, it's sort of like. You joke about your idiot uncle, right? He's still your uncle. You still got to own it, and everything he does, you still have to clean up, even though you make jokes about it. We have to fix our political system. I mean, is this is this is this new Always configuration try. of the U.S. Supreme Court going to adequately fix the gerrymandering issues that that are before them? And they've got the Wisconsin case. Mm-hmm. There's going to be out. internet privacy coming up again too. There's going to be repeated efforts to enhance business protections at the expense of consumer protections, and that's going to happen in the next three to four years. And you're going to see. Uh, a, a remarkable change in the way that we do packaging because all of the things that we've been protected from for all these years that are more costly to the producers, they're going to get away from. So it, the little nice foil packages on the inside. Remember that was born out of some guy that put anthrax in food or some crap like that? It remember was, that? I think it was something in Tylenol. Yeah, yeah. You know, <laughs> right. so. They were like uh, doing something Right. Tylenol. So when, when it comes down to it, now the haze and the, the hype away from that is gone. So now manufacturers want to go back to the old way. Uh, because there's not really any new controversy driving the need for them to spend the extra bucks on it. Now, whether or not that'll drive pricing of the products down, I, I seriously doubt it. What happens in the real world is when you give manufacturers a break, they don't lower the price of the product. They just eat up the profits. Or they make the sizes smaller and charge the same price. Exactly correct. So, you know, one of the things I, I always criticize is when people talk about trickle-down economics, I can understand where the concept is, but if there's no mandatory reinvestment of the advantage given to business back into the workforce or, or a reduction in the cost per unit item, then it's a wasteful program. And there's never been a realistic effort for us to enforce business to give discounts on merchandise if we give them discounts in the tax bill or to hire more people or to give people a better wage if we give them a break on their tax bill. But yet the government still gives some breaks on the tax bill all the time and calls it business incentive and they just buy more yachts and enjoy more luxury perks their profit margins just larger it never it never makes it down to the rest of us ever yeah. i'm still waiting for the reaganomics to trickle down because i'm you know i'm a lot older than you so i was around during reagan mm-hmm. still hasn't hit me i'm still waiting yep I, I graduated high school in 1983 and we were very anti-reagan i i brought i participated with michael moore in a protest at uh, what used to be called Saginaw Detroit Streets. Now it's uh, like MLK Junior Boulevard and something else. But uh, uh, and and Reagan and his death squads in Nicaragua and, and El Salvador and and all of the bullying that he did with his big stick diplomacy in the Western Hemisphere and inspired a lot of people to remind themselves that politics were still very real. I still have images of that of his oh, that Nancy Reagan that. Was. 
I, I don't even want to discuss it. Uh, you know, and, <laughs> and, and look, underneath the Reagan administration, a lot of things were begun. Just like underneath the Nixon administration, a lot of things were done. Uh, we can look at the destruction of the Soviet Union. You can say, you know, good politics. You can say that they lost the race to, to make nuclear bombs, and it was so expensive it bankrupt their entire nation. That's that's really what it amounts to by some historian's perspective. But the fact is nobody was 100% bad or 100% good. I'm having a hard time feeling that about Donald J, though. Yeah. No, this is a new level of things. Yeah. All I know. Show, show, I, right, find a pro. Show I, me a pro, please, uh, somewhere. The only thing he did when he first came to office is he made an executive order that prevented people from leaving public office and going directly into lobbying for two years on a federal level. And that was his first and only effort that I've ever seen to drain the swamp. I didn't even know about that, but I could give a little bit of credit for that also. I, I have said, I, take, I'm saying I agree with you on something that you just made me aware of. No, I thought you were taking credit for Donald Trump's decision to do that. I was like, wow, that's powerful. Jamie no, no, I'm not taking credit for that. That was awesome, though. For a minute, that was a great, I was excited. That was cool. We just <laughs> talked excited. about how persuasive you were. Okay, well, yeah. didn't happen. <laughs> we could lie about it, though. Now I forgot what I was talking about. Oh, I, I, we win. We talked about it on this show before and uh, just recently had this discussion with a few others. And nobody has has yet to demonstrate the person who was not in support of Trump during the campaign, did not vote for him, but started seeing him in action. And then just said, hey, wait a minute, maybe this is my guy. <laughs> <laughs> He's not winning over any Congress. Yeah, I'm, not, yeah. I'm not sure if that person's out there. And if there no. is, I, I, I'm curious to know how that, how that happened. I don't even hear yeah, people are, say, just give him a chance. Yeah. You know, just give him a chance. 313 if you want to weigh in on this Perhaps very Sean important Hannity, stuff. A, a, a new Trump fan. Or throw recently a, formed yeah, oh, please Trump Please defend Trump. Please. How about ev- everybody that ran against him for president and then had to eat crow when he beat their ass in the oh. election, you know, in the, in the Republican primary what were like 12 or 14 candidates at first and now all of those people have to suck up and call him mr president because they didn't get the job done a oh. couple of couple of them risked it and started sucking it up early on and I know. somehow got rewarded ben carson has got some kind of a public position now for the trump administration he's, he's head of hud oh my god Honest to God, Rick, he's head of public housing. Uh, and Dr. Ben Carson, you know, he said some crazy things during the campaign. It's one of the reasons why he didn't do better. He thinks the, Jesus the, rode in on a dinosaur, the, for God's sake. The, the pyramids are grain silos. Right. Oh, my God. <laughs> Lunatic. He, you know, he's a brain surgeon and perhaps successfully, like, is trained to do that mm-hmm. complex well, work sure and things like that. But, but doesn't mean he's not... Uh, right. Sane. I mean, it doesn't no. mean he's sane. He's he's clearly not. Clearly we not. need a competency exam for some of these <laughs> offices. Okay, frankly, if you can't be Secretary of State, if you can't find Yugoslavia on a map, okay, if you can't name Sierra Leone, if you can't tell me the capital of the Philippines, how, how about an executive order that if you weren't just trying to eliminate a department, you don't be made the head of it I shortly know. thereafter? Oh gosh. I mean, well, the real problem is every single one of those candidates would have had a major flaw. Like major, major flaw that we could have all seen. But N- nobody, well, the, the yeah, nobody for, made me feel Hillary, safe. But not to make us look too. like idiots the world yeah. over. I don't I mean, know. This, I, this I just, I just feel like I, just, this. I feel like uh, I felt more comfortable with other candidates only because I felt like things may just stay the same. But I wasn't really like I was trying to vote more for somebody who wouldn't like condemn us. Whoever wasn't gonna like destroy us the well that's most. that's certainly not ben trump he's done nothing but condemn ben people trump? he's condemned the, the puerto ricans oh, only 58 people died in your event oh that's not, not well he, all, he he represented somebody who was not hillary yeah he, he represented somebody who was not previously a politician a lot of people fed up with the with the uh you know current the status quo sure, when he i need brain market. surgery i'm you, gonna hire the the and, dog catcher, and even if right? you don't right. hate hillary you'd have to know that she's status quo so if you still want to change yep. i mean you still have to go look elsewhere well, we got change all right. and so and so that's what he did and I know i've talked to adam brooke about this who calls it his train wreck theory where let him get in there do what he's doing fuck everything up and then we're going to have to come back and make some changes and fix well i agree i think i think i and in some ways I, I believe that that's true because it fired everybody up he's so inspired now you've got, activism yeah he, he right. really has now I mean. you've got a situation where americans are interested in what's going on again and, and for a lot of years americans just didn't give a shit as long as as they woke up in the morning and their cornflakes were there and their car was there and they could part they were fine we'll see in now, 2018 you know, how, how much extra how much extra like concern there is because the, the the voting numbers should be significantly yeah. better if we can really like get people to be concerned well, as about long as as long as we still get daily daily you know crazy shit from trump i'm sure that'll be fine 
you know, I know a lot of people that love that daily crazy shit from Trump. You know, you used to talk about special television programs about Lost, right, right? and <laughs> Dynasty, and that now That's we have our own tweet daily today. TV program. Don't you have a vision of him like sitting in the bathroom Chief at Chito. three in the morning tweeting? Because yes. who used to do that? Oh LB, God, LBJ so used to sit I actually on, right. envision the, Not tweeting, the excrement to, leaving the but that's anal what walls I think he's and doing. being I think he's sitting on the can tweeting, and I Ugh. think that's just so disgusting, and his phone is probably crawling with... I don't even want to. Oh. Yeah, it's funny. Okay. You've been censored. He's just staring down at, at his Chad Jr. At, at some grape skin. That's oh some, my uh, god! This uh, is some, some floating what kernels I think of corn. Is happening. Yep. Yep. So uh, uh, Trump said about Rex Tillerson uh, that he should take an IQ exam to prove Trump smarter as adult human beings are want to do. He says, "I think it's fake news, but if he did that, I guess we'll have to compare IQ tests, and I can tell you who's going to win." Can't you? Don't you need to be able to read? No, that's to a, take that's an a IQ quote test? from Trump, or is yes, that a quote from Tillerson? Quote, <laughs> that's a quote from Trump. <laughs> okay. That's a quote from Trump. It's, 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 it sounds like a Trumpism, IQ but I know that, that other dudes are calling him a moron lately. Tillerson. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Uh, he said the Oval Office has been freshly renovated with drapes, carpet, and fixtures that lean heavily on gold. This is all in just in one press conference, true. Uh, I've had just about the most legislation passed of any president in a <laughs> nine-month period that's ever served. We had nothing. Is he confusing he's executive nothing. orders with legislation? Maybe? I, I am well, faded out, too. He's nothing. I don't understand. Yeah, we had passed over 50 bills. I'm not talking about executive orders only, which are very important. I'm talking about bills. Yeah, I mean, he, he set the standard with the most executive orders of anybody. <laughs> well, he's saying that he did that, right? Uh, he no, is he saying that. Right, I'm yes. saying, yeah, does he must be confusing executive yep. orders. And, of course, President Jimmy Carter signed 70 bills in the first six months, so he's totally blown. Uh, Bill Clinton signed 50. Um, Mr. Truman and Franklin Delano Roosevelt both signed more bills into law by their 100-day mark than Trump did in almost twice that time. Uh, you know, I think the concept of reciprocal is a very nice concept. I, I don't think he that. understands how government works. So when he signs something, he thinks that this is something magical that he's done, apparently. So Loyalty. Here's Loyalty. another one. Loyalty from everybody. Trump boasts that the gross domestic product last quarter hit 3.1% and claimed Obama never hit that number. When informed by reporters that his predecessor did it several times, Trump immediately said he never hit it on a yearly basis. Never hit it on a yearly basis. You haven't even been in for a year, dude. You haven't even been in for a year yet, so how are you claiming that as a credit? Uh, but you know, when it comes down to it, um, we will weather the storm, and after four we have years— no choice. I know. The, the impeachment process is so It so doesn't awkward. remove him from office, though. Impeachment will not remove him from office. No, it doesn't. There's only two ways to leave office, and neither one's about to happen. Well, they're not going to declare him mentally incompetent. That well, would that would be three ways. Okay, yeah. I'm going to add th the third way on. Yep. Oh, just just horrible. So when it, we're talking about saving America from itself, right— uh, and to a certain degree, you can only do so much. But there are so many things you can do on a local level to save your local community from, from bad That's action. Where it starts. One thing that I think a lot of people don't realize, Deb Young, that we have here in the studio, led several local petitions in order to liberalize marijuana laws in communities across Oakland County. Deb, am I right when I say five successful campaigns? Five, and I participated in six. Yep. So the first one was a group. And it's mainly, and I, and I came in and towards the end of that one. And it's mainly all of the southern Oakland County yeah, cities. Yeah, it's it's all one one. Um, the district. One district, right? So we did all of, of the district abutting Detroit. Yep. So uh, that's an amazing southern accomplishment. And it, when we talk about it, remember this in the context of a state police that's coming down on on mar medical marijuana, uh, a communities that are just starting to accept the concept that there are sick people that actually can use this. We had to do a lot of education during that time. This was not an easy period of time to sell the marijuana issue. Now in 2017, for a lot of people, they're already educated and advanced, but a lot of that education came on the backs of Deb and Jamie, myself, and some other people. It in did, it did, because a lot of people did not really understand the concept. And a lot of people said, oh, isn't it already legal? Mm -hmm. And we said, no, we've got medical marijuana. But this was recreational that we were legalizing. Right. And actually, as you know, not really legalizing because state law trumped it, federal law trumps it. But it kind of opened the floodgates and it, it showed people, you know, what what the general consensus was, mm -hmm. what this was all about. And I think it really paved the way for a statewide uh, campaign. We talk yeah. about local legal as well. Yeah. Right. And of course, mm -hmm. that's all uh, medical came, the, the five cities. Sure. Mainly engineered by uh, by Chuck and Tim. Chuck and Tim, sure. And uh, that 
led to MPP coming in. Right. Doing Chuck Green, Tim Beck. Right. Yeah. You, you start to get it out into Safer the mission. open so people are looking at it as a normal issue, as something that, that is happening in other communities, something that, you know, it's, it's not taboo, and I think that really helped. I agree with that. I think yeah. it's getting to be close to a time to... Yeah, yeah, I feel like so it to be all great back time. and, and uh, do something worthwhile besides, you know, well, bantering. I, I had something special here. I, I, oh. I like this Ooh. new Snoop Lion stuff, so oh, I'm going to yeah, play I that. Oh, yeah, I do too. Um, yeah, and then you guys all know what's coming up after or just at 5 p.m., just after. News at 5 by Rick Thompson, as always. A little bit after. And then we'll Maybe a little bit after. This break is going to go extended. We, we ended up talking a lot. We've got a wonderful guest in studio today, so you can't blame us. Well, this. Th- am I, am oh I, yeah. Okay. I'm sorry, I can't hear myself. Uh, this break though might not be the extended break, just because we do have a caller caller calling in a little bit after five, right after uh, Rick's news. So t- awesome. I don't want to like stretch it out it? too much. That is Attorney Paul Talinda, who's been nice. very active uh, ever since the passage of the Michigan Medical Marijuana Act, and has been uh, one of us. He's been yeah. one of those lawyers that have, has uh, stood with us as an activist. Of, defended us in court helped out business situations and the whole gamut yeah yeah all right well we're gonna go uh into this song and when we come back it'll be uh rick with the news and we're back and rick maybe possibly if we if we treat him particularly well might give us a little news i don't know it's seven minutes late we might please, not want to hear it. please late, let us have the me? news you know what we can probably do that am i you're on okay rick thompson with the news yeah, good afternoon everybody it's the cannabis news it's october 10th 2017 how about we do some national news today the f- recorded first month of recreational marijuana sales in nevada Nevada's rec marijuana industry is off to a blistering start with early sales far surpassing the totals other adult use markets posed their first few weeks. The development highlights how different approaches to the rollout of the recreational marijuana as well as unique market dynamics can greatly influence early sales. Dispensaries in Nevada sold a whopping $27 million worth of recreational cannabis during a single month. $27 million, one month, Nevada. Go Las Vegas. That's nearly double the tally during the first month of sales in Colorado. And more than seven times the amount Washington State recorded. And the figures also almost double the $14 million Oregon posted in the first month of taxed recreational sales. Now, in that instance, no data is available for the three-month period of sales before the tax took effect. But, wow, talk about a proof statement there. You know, there's so many other things to talk about. Why don't we talk about uh, flower power in New York, courtesy of MJ Business Daily. A New York industry insider was not surprised to see a report that the state's legal medical marijuana businesses are losing potential patients to the black market. What a surprise. Reasons given were, one, high cost of legal medical products, two, inconvenient bureaucracy, Three, patients' preference for cannabis flower, which the New York program does not allow. Despite those disheartening plans for New York program, uh, PharmaCan COO Jeremy Unruh sees positives down the road, like state regulators considering new draft regulations that could attract more patients. Uh, New York, through October, has only registered about 31,000 medical marijuana patients out of 20 million residents. That's what we like to call a bad program. How about Maryland? Maryland's medical marijuana program has been plagued by delays, but the issuance of eight new licenses might mean the program is finally finding its feet. One of Maryland's newly licensed dispensary owners says it's been a long time coming. Maryland regulators this week licensed two dispensaries, two more labs, three processors, and one cultivator processor. Although a workable MMJ program was passed by lawmakers in Maryland in 2014, the process of planning for this advancement began five years ago. Two other rules also work in favor of Maryland's medical marijuana program. The state already allows MMJ recommendations for chronic pain treatment, and any doctor or resident may petition the MMJ commission to add conditions to the qualifying list. 
millions of dollars. That's how much money Michigan's licensed medical cannabis businesses could save thanks to a new rule from the state's Department of Licensing and Regulatory Affairs allowing companies to utilize multiple Class C cultivation permits at a single location. Each permit would allow up to 1,500 cannabis plants. We've talked about this many, many times. Once Michigan's new regulations are in place, a licensed cannabis company that desires a large-scale commercial grow will be able to do so at a single location. And in one building, you can do all the mechanics like HVAC, centralized system with 15 separate entities and 15 separate locations. You'd have to pay all those mechanics in each location according to uh, our friend uh, Michael Mays, CEO of Green Wave Naturals in Lansing. Regulators are doing a decent job listening to Michigan's MMJ executives who are lobbying Lara for business-friendly regulations that will allow companies to produce at volume without unnecessary roadblocks. That's un- unfortunate to read, isn't it? Lara also allowing vertically integrated MMJ operations is another example of that, according to him. Now, how about Ontario? Ontario is Canada's multi-billion dollar legal marijuana hub. One year ahead of recreational marijuana legalization, Ontario has become the hub of Canada's licensed production. Hey, Ontario, just across the the big water from us. Large licensed producers dominate the province's marijuana sector. Opportunities for entrepreneurs are less widespread and are expected to be available in ancillary businesses like security, greenhouse supplies, and accounting. That sounds really eerily familiar. Ontario has the most potential consumers of any province. It's also home to the most... LPs, including industry heavyweights Canopy Growth in Smith Falls and Afria in Leamington, Ontario. And it is the epicenter of cannibals, Canada's okay. marijuana oh, market. No. <laughs> the, the Canadian cannibals Great. are involved in the marijuana capital market. Those are served by investment firms and venture capitalists. Another factor in Ontario's favor is a nascent pharmaceutical sector revolving around cannabis that is largely based near Toronto. The province's strong cannabis foundation is built on its base of licensed cultivators, strengthened life sciences research and development, and a world-class industrial greenhouse sector with well-established supply chains. That sounds like a win-win situation. We should copy that here in Michigan. Folks, that's the news. It's October 10th, 2017. I'm Rick Thompson. Thank you for listening. Awesome. Good job, Rick. And following right up, look, we have a caller. Somebody must be interested to talk to us. I'm going to take it. Or it could be the person who we prearranged to call us. Who would also be interested in talking still with us. Who might be interested in talking to Hello, us. Hello. Welcome uh, to the Jazz Cabbage Cafe. Uh, who am I speaking with? I'm, I might be interested in talking to you. <laughs> I this, hope is, this is Paul. How are you guys? Paul Talinda, Attorney Paul Talinda. How are you doing? Good, very well, thanks. Paul, I'm so glad to hear that you're listening out of generosity, not because we're on the clock here, because I know what you charge. So, yeah, it's not too bad. <laughs> <laughs> After hours. <laughs> oh, isn't that double time? <laughs> Paul Talendis. True. We, we talked about Paul a little bit uh, in an earlier section of the Paul, of the show. Uh, Paul's a criminal defense attorney with a long history of defending patients in Michigan uh, in a wide variety of communities. Uh, he's from the Gross Point area and does a great job in Wayne County, but I've seen him stretch all the way up into, what, Port Huron areas? You've gone well beyond that, too, haven't you, Paul? I, I was just coming out of St. Lac County this afternoon as we speak, actually. So Exactly. So so uh, that's a, a oh, real fun. tough area, too, when you're talking about the I-94 drug corridor. Well, some of the stuff's become kind of yeah. highly specialized, and Paul's in a, small, a relatively small group of lawyers who really know all the nuances yeah. and ins and outs of this of this whole thing. It's becoming that way, yeah, which is kind of interesting. It's also become kind of terrifying, too, when you get somebody who's just, oh, I can handle this case, sure, and then next thing you know, you have to pay someone to clean it up. A lot of people call themselves medical marijuana attorneys, and and, uh, when we have a discussion and they haven't heard about a lot of basic things or what's happening in other courts around there, it becomes a little concerning. Mm -hmm. It's it's troubling there. Everybody's a medical marijuana lawyer these days. If you let everybody claim to be a gynecologist that wanted to be a gynecologist it probably would be a pretty gross situation so you know we should have some kind of a, it would be yeah there should We'd be, be some, there should be some standards right now, if that were the case. yeah that's right <laughs> i would so, not be a doctor so paul one of the things we talked about earlier was uh the agro case and, and jamie of course gave a little bit of a rundown and, and discussed mm-hmm. the longevity of the case and its significance and, and how it's really being underplayed but i think we wanted to explore that a little bit right jamie yeah and i, and, and I think maybe 
Nick and or some of the other agro family members may be interested in the future and kind of discussing their perspective and their experience with the whole thing. And it includes, you know, the, the, the tragic loss of the, the father of the family along the way. Uh, but just recently there was some kind of resolution. And um, so, Paul, really, whatever, however you'd like to, to kind of approach this, because it, it's, 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 there's a lot to it. Yeah, ultimately what the – God, where do I even, where do I even start off? It was, it's a seven-year it was, it was seven process, and I think it was finalized just within 30 days of the seven-year mark from the initial raid, right. which started the arrests and the charges and the process and multiple trips to the Court of Appeals and a couple trips to the Supreme Court and uh, that, that whole thing. What it ended up really turning on was – the fact that the conspiracy charge, the conspiracy to commit these crimes, to deliver these controlled substances, was a specific intent crime, meaning that the defendants had to specifically have intended to break the law, which we debated about from the beginning and really became the main issue at the end was if the judge would allow um, the defendants to testify as to their state of mind. And the prosecution fought and said, no, you can't use a mistake of laws and excuse and so on and so forth. And we all knew, again, with the specific intent nature of the crime, that speaking to your state of mind was always going to happen. It was always a possibility. The attorneys always knew that was a big part of the uh, trial preparation. Uh, when the prosecution knew they couldn't overcome that hurdle, they had, um, and the judge granted that that uh, that ability specifically by by losing the or by denying the prosecutor's motion by saying, no, of course this is specific intent crime. You have to talk about state of mind. The prosecutor took that to the court of appeals, and then tried to take that to the uh, Supreme Court when it was denied at the court of appeals. When the Supreme Court refused to hear it, it changed the tenor because now the prosecution knew that these defendants could get up there and testify as to why they were doing what they're doing, uh, which everybody knew Ferndale had told them it was okay. The mayor had been there and we're all fairly familiar with that part of the story. Um, and then towards the end, we were about, maybe we were within a, a, a handful of weeks, maybe a month uh, within the original trial date. And uh, the prosecution dropped the charges against the individuals and levied one new charge of the uh, possession with intent to deliver or the delivery of marijuana on the corporation, which hadn't existed in seven years at this point. Um, the corporation took a plea through its designated agent. It was assessed a fine and um, the other cases were closed. Yes. So let's let's set the stage here, though. This all based on a raid in 2010. All this jockeying between yeah. uh, Court of Appeals and Supreme Court and everything took place uh -huh. from 2010 all the way up through 2016. Then in 2017, uh -huh. the prosecution realized they were going to get their ass kicked in court and then capitulated yeah. by agreeing to some crazy stipulation that only resulted in a misdemeanor to a corporation instead of all the felony yeah. drug charges that they intended in yep. 2010 when they originally raided the, the, the dispensary. Just, just to expand on something that yeah. Paul touched on for a second, they, yeah. they went through the, the, the proper channels of dealing with the city, got zoned uh -huh. the proper place. Yep. The mayor came in, approval of Craig Covey, yep. who later ran against uh, Sheriff Bouchard for sheriff on a, on a pro-marijuana platform. Okay. Um, and, then, uh, and then also... The uh, the county executive Elberts Patterson w was saying sp specifically on his own website that this should be something that the locals choose how they want to deal with it. So that in addition, that was actually right. He and and he had put together it was it's this infamous sixty two page letter that was like one page of saying it's up to you cities how to decide. And here's a bunch of examples from Oakland County cities who had ordinances that went one way or another. When we brought that up in court. They fought us tooth and nail, and all of a sudden that thing disappeared from the website. Mm -hmm. Yep, they realized it was a tool for def for criminal defense attorneys and the Oakland County yeah. Prosecutor's Department having you know dominion and control over everything that happens in stupid Oakland County. Uh, just wave their magic wand, right. and all of a sudden, poof, your help goes away. Yeah. Right, because it wasn't just us that they were that they were flying this kite against. They said, okay, well, hey, we can 
no cities matter. The, the county is superior. We'll go through there and challenge it because in the theory that we had, which is the puzzling part, is that we did have a, a true entrapment by estoppel defense because we did have the police officers, the police chief, the police department's consent, and they are the ones who are in charge of interpreting criminal law, and they signed off on it. And that was a successful argument that I had used in other dispensary cases in Oakland County. And that was where Oakland County's attention turned was to say, doesn't matter if you have municipal approval. It didn't matter if you had anybody else's approval except the police department because they're, they're in control of the criminal interpretation. Mm -hmm. But that was how they were slicing it very thin, which I think later found out to be, you know, later was proven to be true. Um, but even still on the fact that they were, you know, you had these motions where it's like, hey, the police chief came through and signed off. I had a dispensary case in Oakland County where my only witness was the police chief. And that's all I intended. And when I told the prosecution that, instead of dismissing the case, he called me about a stipulated set of facts that we could have the judge make a finding on. So they, even in the point of saying you're completely wrong, I'm going to win my case, instead of being able to concede... They just said, well, how about we find an agreement to where the judge can make the decision, not us. Mm. And speaking of that, Paul, you, you've been in cases where the attorney general is the prosecutor. I know you have. Yeah. And, and, mm -hmm. and isn't it still, also true? Still in one. <laughs> yeah. Like when, when, you, when you've gotten the best of them and it's obvious, you know, kind of what direction it's heading, they don't stop. They, they play it out as long and as hard as they possibly can. You know, there, there's, there's, political, there's a political side to that, too, where it's like, okay, so – the AG really isn't fighting the case. He's sending good foot soldiers to fight it, and he just, you know, keeps them on that hill until they fight, 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 because he's got all the resources, you know, at his fingertips, um, even if they're wrong. You know, I've had, even with these current dispensary cases, I've asked AGs to say, okay, well, now, um, now the dispensaries are legal, how are we still having a dispensary case? And the answer is typically is something that's above my pay grade, or, hey, I'm just here. I just get paid to show up. You know, they're not thinking functionaries of the system. They're more just <laughs> responding to what their boss wants to do. Um, but the biggest problem with a lot of these prosecutions and maybe with prosecutions in general is that there's a, a, a point of being overzealous where you can't back out and look weak. You have to, you know, you can't pull the arrow out. You have to drive the arrow through and you have to make it look like the process was the reason you won or the reason that there was this victory not because oh i screwed up and i overcharged you or i messed up yeah. that shows weakness that shows vulnerability down the road so if the open county prosecutor's office had said oh hey maybe we'll change our stance on dispensaries or maybe we can't win these cases um it shows weakness because then it compromises all the other cases they prosecute and they say oh well maybe you're being as dumb on this murder case as you are in these dispensary cases. Who knows? So it's a slippery slope for them. Yeah. And a lot of attorneys don't, you know, don't acknowledge the fact that you're, if your prosecutor has a crap case and they're telling you no deal, don't just sit there and take the plea. I've been victimized by that whole attorney general situation. Our, our dispensary in Chesterfield Township, we were sued mm -hmm. by the, the township itself, and then the attorney general uh, jumped in on that. And uh, uh, joined in in the in the courtroom antics that uh, that went yeah. down with that, and all of our depositions and all of that shit. So yeah. right, and and that's and that was back at the time when you know they were going to get you one way or another. You know they were going to come after you, and if they couldn't get you, you know, come in and get you going. And it was more or less because they didn't have a roadmap. You know they were afraid of what the possibilities were and. No one knew quite how to handle the battle. You know, in, in perspective, I'm actually glad that, you know, Chesterfield went about it that way rather than dealing with it, you know, in the way Oakland County did. Yeah, the way they did us in in, <laughs> in Oak Park, right, with the, with the guns yeah, the Right. You know, and, I mean, it was, there was so much cat and mouse going on there, too. You know, it was just, it's, it's an unnecessary use of resources where it's like, yeah, you got this cop sitting out in front of the store waiting to pull over these patients. When there's guys doing 90 down eight mile, you know, two blocks away, it just none of it made sense at the point. So, uh, but what are we hopeful for as far as uh, uh, you know 
decisions perhaps that might be pending from the appellate court or the Supreme Court that might be positive for patients? Do we have any idea what's going on? You know what's funny? I'm glad you brought that up. Is I've got a couple cases that are in the appellate courts, uh, Court of Appeals and Supreme Court, that are relatively old at this point. They're 2016 you know, appeals that they were submitted about a year ago, over a year ago at some point. Um, and they're all more or less with the later interpretations of the Medical Marijuana Act or the additions, um, some heart rate and tuttle issues. And I have one now in the Supreme Court about the retroactivity. And it's, and I've been waiting for other cases from the, from the Court of Appeals and the like, and those cases have come out since then. So it seems to me that they're either sitting on a handful of marijuana cases waiting to either consolidate them to wait for like an ideal case that sets, you know, a whole bunch of standards and makes a bunch of new rules and clears a bunch of other cases off their desk. Um, or depending on what happens after December 15th or through the process, um, if they make any deference to the facilities act to say, okay, all this is now more or less, you know, permissive as an administrative rule, um, you know, take your remedies up that way, or maybe they'll, I don't know. It, it's, it's hard because the laws that everybody's accused of that we're all appealing are still currently good laws that would st- are still going to be good laws after the passage of all these acts, you know, despite, you know, other than legalization. Paul, doesn't, so doesn't, doesn't the court it's like hard to, to say what, doesn't the court like to clear but, their docket at the end of the calendar year and start 2017 or, or 2018 or 2019 fresh? My, my impression has always been they like to start every session fresh Uh, so that's why like you get like the anxiety towards oh they're about to take a break and you'll get like a week's worth of opinions all just pushed out because they're about to go on vacation yeah um that's typically what i wait for um or you know usually after the case is heard give it six months to eight months before the opinion comes out um but it just seems these marijuana cases they're sitting there it's like they're they're sitting on one person's desk waiting for that one person to do you know, something fairly broad with all of it. And, and, and that's like I said, I'm waiting for a case that's either a general case, that's one big rule, or them denying them all and saying, you know, we, but that's, I go back to it. If they would have denied these cases, if we were waiting for what had happened to all the prosecution motions in the clinical release case, where they just said, we're not going to hear it, we're not going to hear it, those opinions come out in months. And if the cases, these marijuana cases that are currently pending, if that were the case, they're going to say, hey, we're not going to hear it. Go forward. I, I want to believe we would have heard that by now. You know, I'm not going to wait a year just for them to say, oh, we're not going to hear it. That's awesome. Especially with cases that have trial dates set or, you know, where it had to be stayed pending the outcome. So, Paul, who would be this one person who, who, you know, we're talking about this mythical individual who may have all of this sitting on their desk? Is that the, the uh, appellate court chief justice who d- dictates who gets what case or where would that be you know what if if there is that if that <laughs> if that one inbox does exist with all these files on it mm-hmm. i would think that it is somewhere up there with um one of the more experienced um clerks because and perhaps at the direction to say, okay, well, we're taking these cases and we're doing this and sit down and find the similarities, find the commonalities, and perhaps see if there are, you know, four or five cases that have um, like a general rule to be extracted from it. You know, and, and I, I see this with gun cases. You'll get, you know, two or three defendants consolidated and they'll have um, – two or three issues and, you know, obviously different set of circumstances, but then the rules they come out with create sort of one comprehensive rule. Um, that's where, I mean, just from the passage of time, that's where my thinking is. Hmm. They're trying to come up with like, not to say like a, like a heart rate tuttle type of reasoning um, or consolidation where they explore all the issues and give you one good roadmap. But Maybe. Maybe Hartwick and Tuttle is the best example we have of, you know, consolidate some cases, get one general rule out of it. Yeah. So, 
Paul, I've got a, uh, a municipal question um, concerning mm-hmm. what's going on in Lansing. I'm going to try to try to clearly articulate what's going on because it's kind of weird. Mm-hmm. Um, and then just get your thoughts on it. Now, this does not have to do with the initiative that was denied ballot access. This is a, a separate issue. Um, that happened, and then the city council passed an ordinance. Uh, mm-hmm. The people then got enough signatures uh, by referendum to push that to ballot. So the council has the choice to kind of rescind that or let it go to ballot to see if the people want to approve their decision on the ordinance. So mm-hmm. if they do just repeal it and take it away what are their options i'm hearing things like they have to wait for a year before they can do something else that they, that maybe they could amend an existing one their existing one of course has to do with the michigan medical marijuana act and not opting into the mmfla mm-hmm. but maybe they can amend it enough to get there i don't i mean what's your opinion on what their what the options would be if they uh, decide to pull it away if they have to rescind that ordinance it doesn't strike me, and I have to explore it, but it doesn't strike me that they couldn't make a ruling on that issue. Um, you know, within if there's the talking about this one year ban, um, it seems to me that they would have to then revisit the um, the language of the ordinance itself, and you know, I guess maybe try to to, to compare it up against what the objections are. Um, my fear is that depending on how or what makes the ballot, you're going to, the ballot will propose a yes or no question. And depending on what that yes or no question is, it's going to be confusing as hell. Because if the council says, okay, fine, we're not going to rescind, we're going to put our proposal um, or our ordinance up on the ballot, and if the people want to say yes or no, then great. So that is a positive. You say yes, you want to opt in. Whereas if they say, we'll put, we're not going to rescind it, we're going to do nothing, um, and you can put your vote, we're going to actually pass our ordinance, we're going to put your vote up as in the opposition on the ballot, and if they vote in opposition, it's going to be, do you oppose the passage of the ordinance, or do you oppose the placement of these facilities as written by it and you vote yes then that's the negative vote so you're opposing so it could get tricky for the voter to say what does this language mean we if we have an ordinance am i voting against it or am i voting on the ordinance as already passed and in terms of when this could be on the when this would be on the ballot it would be depending on the deadline on the next available election time, which would Spring. be November. Oh, November. No, that's well, probably too, it's probably too close to November for it to still make it. To that's November. what I'm saying. Yeah. If it's cut off now, then we have a, an election in the spring. Who the hell votes in the springtime? Old people. Yep. Right. Well, so the it's the, is, the the issue of how it gets thing is less to me right now less important than mm-hmm. you know does this now stop everything or can the city council do something? I think the city council can do things because. The other one is if they're saying we can't pass this FLA ordinance because of a technicality, we can't in- introduce another ordinance, but the city wants to um, uh, wants to take a you know take advantage of it, then they can go back and amend the existing MMA ordinance, which may not be good for people who use it, but it's better than nothing. But it's also I don't know that's politically dicey because that's a backdoor. You're going to say, oh, fine, we're not going to the FLA. This way, we're going to go backdoor the FLA. Those meetings are going to become more problematic. You know, it's going to be more of a, of a, there's going to be more political backlash. I mean, no one, these aren't, you know, that's the problem with city council in these positions. These aren't brave political positions. These aren't people who say, okay, well, I can, you know, go against half the voters. These are people who say, hey, I depend on, you know, my job is to give the voters what they want. And a lot of them, if they hear any, real vocal pushback they'll take that as a no despite all of the approval that they're hearing otherwise right um that's the hard part i mean god if lansing if they have enough signatures to get the opposition on the ballot i think lansing's smart move is to let that happen because they might not if it passes and there's an ordinance and they, they suspend the ordinance pending the results of the election um I fuck, I don't know. It's it's an odd, it's a very odd position. It's a very 
odd position. It's strange. And I think I, the, the I, intent I think, of the of the signature gatherers in this case was good. It was noble. It was like this is too restrictive. We you know this is not what we were asking for. You can't just ram this down our throats. But now that there's a situation where nothing may happen for a little while as a result of it, but that that may be okay mm-hmm. for a lot of people. Well, and and that might be if that's the intent to say, hey, look, we want it less restrictive. Um, I guess the question of when, because it, it you know, it, there's two theories on stuff like this is, do you fix the car while it's in motion? You know, do you, are you essentially building the plane while you're flying it and fixing it while you're flying it? Or are you the idealist to say, this must be perfect before it takes off? Yeah, because they could have let this pass and then just worked on a subsequent uh, measure for a few months from now and fix some of those things. Sure. Potentially. And I, and I, I tell you what, politically, <clears throat> Politically, it's easier to make the amendments because you're starting at a point of agreement. You're saying, hey, we agree with the facilities licensing act. We agree that there should be dispensaries. Okay, now let's talk about how. Yeah. So you're not, you're not starting with a disagreement. You're, you're starting with the fact that you are agreeing on the same side. So if you have if, – if these are pro-facilities people who are anti-ordinance, sometimes it's – you know. You, and we're marijuana community is terrible at this, recognizing an enemy versus an imperfect friend. Incremental increase, not perfect, but we gain some ground here. Correct. Where we could just let it not get any, so it's always that balance. Right. Of... Correct, and it's the same way as, like, okay, build a house or remodel a house. You know, they want to build a house, they want it perfect. Well, that's a longer process. Mm-hmm. Buy a house, put some paint on it, make it the way you like it. Nothing is perfect. Politics is give and take. Politics is the worst compromise of your life. So that's I, that's the trouble is that the people who are let's say pro marijuana but anti ordinance, you know, they'll have nothing instead of something, and if perhaps you know that's what we, that's what they want. Who knows? Yeah, that's a tough but, call. I mean, I've been a, I'm an idealist of sorts when it comes to this issue, and it's taken me a long time to realize you know that you have to take some ground when it's given to you. And uh, I, I, I feel for the people who are trying to hit the home run a little bit because that's kind of how I feel too. But I have recognized it doesn't quite work like that, and you're not functional if that's your approach. No, and I, and I tell you what, here this is the analogy that, that unfortunately hits home is that politics is like finding pot on vacation, right? You don't care at some points what it is. I got a bag of weed. The people who are just like, I got nothing. I have no options. There's no. It's not legal here. I'm in the middle of nowhere, and you know beggars can't be choosers when it comes to it. Right. They're holding off. It's like you want to smoke a joint of swag or smoke nothing. And it's like okay, well, what kind of guy are you? What do you make? You know, what are you made of? <clears throat> if you're really holding out for that, and you're a purist, then you will suffer until you get to your goal. If you are looking to get things accomplished, then you can maybe perhaps make more with the very little they give you, as long as you're willing to participate. I would again, smoke. I would smoke the joint of shitty weed. Just for the record. Fuck yeah, all day. Give me two of them. <laughs> yeah. I would have smoked because it some gets you closer to your goal. Yep, I agree. That's uh, that's you a know, given. and it, terrible because we can't agree that like yes, we should start by saying yes, we want facilities in our in our cities. Get the police power ordinance passed that says we want them. Now let's fight over zoning. So when are you running for mayor of a city, there, Paul? We we need to wrap it up, but I just <laughs> want to know. We got to get you in public <laughs> office, bud. Till end of 2020, look for it somewhere. Right. Now more than ever. Better than Jeff Figer 2020, <laughs> which I've been seeing on my television. You should you should have his, have his ad budget, Paul. Listen, Paul, thanks very much for joining us here on the Jazz Yeah, thanks, Cabbage guys. I appreciate Cafe. it. We always hey, we'll have it. you in studio one of these times, too, man. Yeah. Yeah. Did Give you? me a shout. Look forward to it. Thanks a lot. Wonderful. Thanks. Take Paul care. Paul Linda, attorney Paul Linda from Gross Point friend of the community yeah what a guy with a, a great pedigree it's it's sad when you measure your accomplishments by other people's misery but the fact is in a, in a criminal defense attorney that's the only thing you've got i mean how many great cases did you f- defend right but each one of those was kind of a shitty he, situation he, he was with the agros for years oh, he was wow. with the big daddy's organization yeah, for yep, years he was yep, with the those. amsdell and then that related cases for years yep. wow. i mean he, he would be booted if he was a bad uh yeah. influence or attorney in these situations here's the other thing we know a lot of attorneys and when you start talking about attorneys there's only two people that i think everybody universally likes and that's mary chardier and paul talenda i mean those i have not heard a negative word about either of those two mary's just fantastic and and of course uh, mary is 
potentially the uh, incoming chairperson of the marijuana law section of the State Bar Association of Michigan. I know Paul's a member, too. It's a great network, the largest of its kind in the nation. Yeah. Started by uh, Bernie. Yeah, by Bernie Jockins. Bernie Jockins from Lapeer, also a, a very excellent medical marijuana attorney and doing a lot of work, and his wife is a commissioner, Elaine. Nice people. Also admitted during a meeting that she was a patient, and it was very moving to some people who, mm-hmm. were, who were there, and they decided to opt in, and it's a very conservative area. I so believe they're in Vegas right now. I believe I saw some <laughs> photos. <laughs> you know, they're, they're relaxing and having a yeah, good time after working like so hard. Like mm-hmm. You know, it, we talked about Deb's successes earlier with uh, petitioning. Um, Lapeer very narrowly, very narrowly missed an opportunity yeah. to have one of those local legal proposals passed in our community. It was, I mean, literally what? Uh, Park, so Parks so went close. in there and switched a few ballots around, yeah. I think. Yeah. Uh, it, was, it was close. It was w- Maybe. literally. But they, we had a lot of active um, op- opposition, and yeah. we did not. I mean, yeah. we had we had one woman who got a little loud in in ha- or in Huntington Woods a little bit, but mm. I mean, it was no big deal. Yeah, so we really didn't face anything. The other thing is, we noticed uh, there's a trend in the communities that chose not to opt to uh, uh, do the local legal or various other marijuana proposals, and they were all very rural communities. Yeah. Harrison yeah. and Claire. Claire, Claire incidentally, well, though, is opting in in the MMFLA, and they're yeah. going to, they just decided to allow for provisioning centers. They originally had uh, cultivation and things like that, and we're not going to have provisioning, and then uh, recently announced that they uh, were going to include that Those as were well. the communities, though, where the, where the people who were running the, the um, campaigns didn't actually live in the communities. And that's a problem when you go into the rural areas. They want to know that this is a local person. and Yeah. So. Well, and I agree that uh, that may be on a factor, but we kind of got our butts kicked in both Harrison and Claire. Yeah. So, I mean, it was yeah. it was decisive. Ben Lapeer was just a very, very smidgen. So. Yeah. But... but uh, what we learned from that is that marijuana law f- reform may be popular across the state, but there are certain places that may be just not There's ready pockets. to. Well, yeah. it, the interesting thing there. And you though, don't need those on a statewide. You don't the, need those little pockets. You this don't. is don't a little them. city, yeah. little tiny city. It didn't take much signatures mm-hmm. to get on the ballot, but there were less people who voted than who signed the petition. Yeah. Yeah. So it's just a fucked up vote. I would I would still say the majority of people in those cities would support it, but they yeah, they didn't getting the people out they, did, they weren't kind of like blah, 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 uh, they weren't kind of like ready to uh, and willing and, well, like and say, able to show on up a and vote. Statewide, <laughs> on a statewide on a statewide those cities mean and yeah. I I don't mean dis- any disrespect to no. folks living in those areas, but th- they don't mean nothing in a statewide. Right. You're just going for the the, the We just wanted to add areas. to the count of how many cities uh, yeah, I, were I know, legalization. I know, but no, you I know. dig it. I certainly and, do. And there are people up there who are good hardcore activists that were willing to sure, jump in and, and yeah. get those signatures with right. us. So well, there was yeah. a lot of work yeah. done up there. I a mean, we we got the signatures twice in Harrison because mm-hmm. they were all lost once, mm-hmm. and so we went back out and just got them again. You know the the awesome nature of involved politics means sometimes you can smile even if you weren't successful right. because the effort of out going out and collecting petitions and educating the public that still carries benefits that moves it everything that. forward still rick yes, it, exactly. it, it does it moves it forward you could yep. go in there maybe a year or two years later and right. and find you could win that a single candidate that runs and fails well, that's one guy on a way boom this type of thing it's it's moving on a way had the unfortunate circumstance where other people who purport to be for legalization we're following around some of the petitioners and actively kind of working against the effort so it did get, get, get the ballot but didn't pass there either right. but we had other pro marijuana people working against it because mm-hmm. right. again it wasn't the wasn't ideal enough for right them. you know and, and we've seen in other states and also here in michigan too sometimes where the marijuana community can be our own worst enemy right. uh, the fact is that there's an awful lot of people that are activists in the marijuana community that didn't really have a lot of success in, in regular industry or regular business for whatever reason but uh, they have a, a significant role to play here and sometimes if you don't play well with others then it means the whole playground suffers so uh, sort of a message to myself i guess actually I was going to but say, the, but I'm uh, glad you did. You know, the larger population areas all passed overwhelmingly, and yeah. uh, and that that's where the real numbers are. That's where the voting population is, pretty saying. much, and that He's demonstrates exactly. that there is overall majority For support. For sure, and, and, right. and, and, and a statewide will do well because in the in your larger areas that people are going to support it, and that's where the voters are. Right. So this is one of the reasons why you see oftentimes uh, campaigns or candidates focusing on cities like Lansing and Detroit and Ann sure, Arbor and Flint and Pontiac and Grand Rapids because 
because that's where the population is. And you see you're, that in presidential, they skip states sure. yes. because it doesn't matter. Yeah, and, and it, so. it's sad, but the, the reality is there's only so many hours in the day. There's exactly. only so many places yeah. you can be. Although I would think that a candidate who really gave a shit would find a but way. it's a mathematical equation. That's what it is, there. and that's how they play it. It's, I know. You know. Well, and this is where, where politics gets reduced down to the ones and zeros, right? Yeah. When you talk about mm-hmm. the importance of data, uh, it, we see the, the accusations of the Russians downloading voter rolls. And you say, why would they download voter rolls? Well, because those are the people that you want to target in your special sure. social media blasts. Because did that, didn't that work so well? It really, so well. it really did. If you look, Michigan went went Republican for president for but the first it, time in decades I, and by the slimmest of I'm margins. so shocked about, about people who are so sponge-minded. You know, know what I mean? I don't know what their word <laughs> there is for it. We just read the things that are obviously yeah. Yeah. non-factual and believe it and it Here's what, excuse how they but think. you know you know who I blame for this Jerry Seinfeld that motherfucker Jerry Seinfeld's fault. That. Because I have tickets to see him in no, it, it, On the <laughs> Seinfeld the program, what we learn as Americans, we learn to adopt the Seinfeldisms into our daily life. Sponge-worthy, right? You know, there's there's all these little well, things. I, well, this was not. I wasn't yeah, discussing that I sponge-worthy. Know. I know. But, uh, okay. well, my point being is that, that uh, what we've learned from television is that you can adopt the things that you see into your daily life, and they sometimes make you cool. Right. So it, when people are uh, are taking a look at some of the fake news that they saw, and then they're they're saying these these crazy crazy wild things and people are going really oh my god they, they felt and then popular. sharing it with all their friends they felt popular now i have because to let all my friends it. see this exactly the, you oh, know yeah. so so the hype uh, uh builds a, a a snowball rolling downhill and it mm-hmm. becomes huge and then when someone pops that balloon then one believes it nobody they they're so invested it, no and and they and they then they'll argue for days yeah. about why it cannot possibly so this is exactly yeah. why marijuana law reform yeah. is difficult to do and why they were so successful at, prohibi- at prohibition because mm-hmm. people just totally believed that everything they said was true oh craziness yep yeah. you guys want to talk about uh cannabis friendly events or? oh my goodness we have <coughs> events to cover right but just a few because also, we only have a few minutes, as you see. This show's over, sadly, in seven minutes. But I wanted to touch on, uh, of course, Rick, you have a crazy event coming up the 15th, which you've given me a guest pass to, and I wanted to tell anybody who's listening that I'm looking for a plus one. <laughs> so if you call into the show at it's 313-879-5059. Free food, right? Right, right. Free, free food and... Some snacks on this one. This one's like a half as long as the typical. Oh, if you snacks. get laid because Free I gave snacks. you two tickets, I'm not going to get laid. I'm a married man. man. That'd be awesome. Less, Shout out, Chloe. Oh, okay. Why can't the wife Lauren. be your plus one? Oh What's goodness. up with that? You don't take a wife as plus no, one? No, I want to. I want to get listeners to come. Oh, oh, oh! This wanna, is a contest. I want to make it a contest, oh, but I also yeah, want to go right. myself because it'd be a good event. Yeah. Motives were. That's right. You guys were misplaced. Anyway, misunderstood totally. Well, I guess. You don't you don't want to talk about it? October fifteenth, yeah, MICBD. Oh, There's two yeah. events going sure, down yeah. that day. Two events going down that day. Yep, uh, we'll have the uh, uh, MICBD uh, MMFLA applicant primer and participant conference at the Kensington Hotel where I was wow. at earlier today. It's beautiful. It's gorgeous. Uh, that w- uh, does require a one hundred dollar ticket for entry. Uh, that takes place from twelve to four, and then afterwards, well, at MICBD dot com you can get those tickets because mm-hmm. I know you want to. Right. And then afterwards, am I legalized? We'll have a uh, networking kind of a fundraiser, and I'm not even sure where it's held. Uh, it's it's know. somewhere in Ann Arbor. It is in Ann Arbor, yep. and it is listed on the site. And uh, go check that out because that will be cool too. Another thing that we learned about this week, uh, just yesterday, uh, licensing and regulatory affairs is going to hold a series of events to discuss uh, the. The new metric system, which is the seed to sale tracking program, and also the Acela program, which is how you introduce uh, applications into the Michigan government database. And those uh, places and locations and times Wednesday, November 8th, Oakland Community College in Farmington Hills. Thursday, November 9th, Saginaw Valley State University at the University Center. And Great Wolf Lodge on Monday, November 13th in Traverse City. Tuesday the 14th, it's in Kalamazoo at the Wings Conference Center, and Wednesday, November 15th, in East Lansing at the Kellogg Conference Center. All of those begin at 9 a.m. I'll be at the Oakland County one. And also October 20th at the Cannabis Council, uh, there will be a fundraiser for MI Legalized 6 to 9, and it will feature musician Billy Davis, who is a little bit of a local legend musically. October 17th, we have the the MMFLA Licensing Board as well. 
Jamie, are there more uh, Am I Legalize events? There are some in Grand Rapids. Check the site, amilegalize.com, for all the information and more than what I happen to know at the moment. Mm -hmm. That's amilegalize.com. I had one of my own. I went to this uh, meetup app on my iPhone and found Elevated Yoga, which is, of course, a 420-friendly yoga session. Uh, ran by this green team 313. They it says I'm a cannabis council too. I'm not yeah, sure cannabis council does it. It's, do they? Yeah, Maybe yeah. that's what it is. Uh -huh. Maybe it is. It says I'm a stoner looking to bring people together yeah, they in call, fun what ways. What do they call it? Stoner yoga? Is wow. that what they call it? I think they want to, he wants to play Twister, not necessarily Oh, well, you can do both. I don't know. Yoga, yoga, Twister. Yeah, I mean, stoner. either way, elevated, weed, yeah. yoga, good time. Wh when is it? Um, this is today, October 10th. It goes almost every day, it looks like. This person is trying to. It's on meetup.com. You can yeah, find this almost every day. That sounds desperate. Yeah. It's not. De it's 6.30 to 10 o'clock. I mean, it's just a session. I mean, I'm sure there's a well, lot a of sesh. yoga facilities. Well, we're, we're definitely That's there. right. It's a sesh. They run daily. Sure, sure. It's a sesh. One of my favorite parts of the show is upon us, boys, when we tell our listeners once again or remind them of what they can do in this next week before our next broadcast. What can they do? We're in the final weeks of signature gathering right now. Certainly, you can volunteer and help us get some signatures. You can donate some money and help us pay for the signatures. And we will then get on the ballot successfully and uh, move <coughs> the needle in terms of uh, cannabis reform law in Michigan very significantly. So that, to me, is the most immediately urgent thing. But, of course, Rick always has some great ideas. I do always have some great ideas, and they're sometimes sexual. Uh, uh, so... As far as ways that you can make a big difference, uh, as we just talked about with Deb here in the studio, uh, discuss with your fellows the opportunity to run a petition drive in your community. Now, the end of 2017, is exactly when you should start planning this so that you can collect signatures during the good months of 2018. Make sure you have your stuff done in time to submit to your local community and get that shit done. Yeah, you would want to kick off in, in late spring, yep. April, yeah. May, right those, around Those communities then. not yet opting in or those uh, needing some direction with how to opt in with the new CRMLA that will pass around the same time. Yeah, or, prepare for all of those. And, and those are absolutely worthy options, but if it's recycling that's an issue to you, if, if uh, making sure that they don't euthanize dogs in the shelter is important, to you if if road repair is important to you no matter what the subject get involved in politics because turn your passion into a public asset uh, i only I, care about cannabis around here. well I, I appreciate that stop crying start applying well, all right yeah. that's a t-shirt right there that's there a t-shirt like that yeah anything else guys we're, we're always good kiss a vet they need it yep am i legalized.com i mean veterinarians it's a great place to start until next week, you're, all right, this is the thanks, jazz. Thanks, Deborah and Paul Tolu. Oh yeah, Deborah, oh, thank you for coming in. So thank you for having oh, us. She'll be she'll be back. You're Lots welcome anytime, Deb. That's Chris. Chris, thanks for saying. helping out uh, with the board work. Sorry, Brock, Talia, Three, shout out. Freedom Works coming up. Yeah, stick around for Freedom Works. Good show. Yeah. I listened to it. All right, so uh, that's it for us. The Jazz Cabbage Cafe. Until next week. <laughs>